عليكم Well, first, let me make. Uh, I have an announcement I want to make. Uh, in Baltimore, they'll be uh, celebrating 70 years of El Islam in Baltimore. So they're having an event there to celebrate El Islam and their embracing of El Islam, both the past, present, and the future. Uh, doors open. It's actually a Saturday, September 30th. The doors open at six o'clock. The program begins at seven o'clock, and the keynotes. They have keynote speakers. This uh, pamphlet didn't say who the keynote speakers will be, but it's seventy dollars per person, forty dollars for the youth. I uh, received ten tickets for it. So if anybody in the community is interested in those, uh, please let me know. I'll get you um, the tickets and give me the money. And I'm sure they would love for you to attend seventy years of Al Islam in Baltimore. It's a huge accomplishment. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Maybe a couple months ago, I did a presentation on uh, the pursuit of knowledge in Al-Islam, or the importance of knowledge in Al-Islam. Um, while doing research on some other things, I stumbled across uh, some staggering statistics here in America pertaining to knowledge and the lack of knowledge lack of understanding. I think the last time that I talked about this, I was saying that we have knowledge at our fingertips, an abundance of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Everything we want to know, but are those things of value? So we know a lot of things, but are those things, things that we ought to know about, things that we should be concerned with? So today I felt that it was uh, necessary for us to to discuss this again and kind of focus more on America. You know, we always consider these other countries as third world countries. Excuse me, close the door. We think of other countries as third world countries saying that they lack in the sophistication that uh, we have here in America, but there are some st staggering statistics uh, when it comes to American literacy and uh, their pursuit of knowledge. And so I want to talk about that as an issue and how and what we can resolve it with. And ultimately, as always, my solution, my resolution to everything is Al Islam. Um, with the um, implementation of Al Islam and the practice of pursuing knowledge those problems that we face can be resolved. So I initially wanted to talk about, I mean, I, said, I know I talked about this previously, and I feel that the pursuit of knowledge is so important that it's okay to talk about it on more than one occasion. The Allah in his Quran, the last revelation to humanity, talked about it literally hundreds of times. So that's the importance that we should have on the pursuit of knowledge. The uh, Arabic word, elm, or its derivative is used over 700 times in the Quran, meaning the creator of the universe mentioned this over 700 times. Whether it is knowledge, understanding, reasoning, the pursuit of knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge, and how that is to be applied, if Allah thinks that it is important, then we also should think that it's important, important enough to reiterate over and over again. The same is true with Muhammad the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa mentions knowledge in his hadith, in his sunnah, he talks about it repeatedly. And throughout this talk, I'll be mentioning some of the things that he said that was not mentioned previously about knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of those who have knowledge, the learned people. So generally, I mean, most of the time, I try not to talk much about myself because I don't think it's uh, imperative to find out me and my story, you know. But in this instance, I did want to just Kind of, I was. I wanted to say that I was pretty lucky, and that Allah has given me um, the um, what is the word uh, the pro the proclivity towards seeking knowledge. Ever since I was a small child, um, I remember when I was maybe nine, ten years old. I realized that I didn't want to play with toys anymore. I wanted to read books. I wanted to learn some things, and I. Oh, that I feel to Allah, to my father, who was another, who was a man who was 
in constant pursuit of knowledge and learning. He read more books than probably anyone I know. I have all of his books at my home currently, and I can't read all of those books. I don't have time to. Maybe when I retire, I can read as many books as he read. I went to his job. He had books in there. Whenever he had spare time, he was reading and learning something. He was a custodian for the city of Norfolk, but he had to be the wisest custodian ever known to man. Um, he is a person who knew something about everything, but he wasn't someone who was conceited in talking about his knowledge. But when I learned new things, and we'll talk about this later, everything I learned, I, I try to, that's the reason I have so many books and booklets is I try to put it in the book so someone else can get it, or I put it on social media so someone else can learn this. I would come to him and say, you know about such and such? And he was like, and he'll start expounding on it. Just like, you know the brother in here, um, um, Devon. Uh, if you notice, he knows a little bit about every single thing. Not just scripture, not just religion, but a little bit about everything that is important to know. If it's something that's important to know, if it's about growing fruit, something about growing food, or any of those things, he always has something, he knows something about it. And I think that is a very admirable trait. But uh, just again, just from my childhood, I realized that I, toys wasn't for me. I wanted to learn something. My mom told me that I was too serious as a teenager because I was uh, mailing, I didn't have any money, so I was mailing letters to South Africa to get knowledge on uh, Ahmed Dida. I was giving out free books. So I said, I don't have any money, so please send me these books. And it took forever to come. I read them all probably in two days because I just was, uh, I had a hunger for knowledge. Um, I would write down all the words that began with the letter S, right? <laughs> in my, in my um, cupboard in my home, in my, home, in my mom's uh, medicine cabinet. So they were scientific words and I would come to her and she didn't know what they meant. So she said, direct me toward a dictionary. Found out the dictionary and the encyclopedia had everything about everything. So I love the dictionary. The first or the word I remember most was Ishmael. So because it's, you know initially was my name, I obviously got my name changed. I realized first that I was pronouncing my name wrong. So it's Ishmael. So it's three syllables, and I was saying Ishmael. My mom, my mom, everybody was calling me Ishmael, right? And I was saying it myself. And it also said uh, it talked about the son of Abraham, and it said in the you know they have. Uh, definition one and definition two, and the second definition it said an outcast, and I I took it as a good thing. I realized that they were saying was well, something was bad, but I thought I am different from other people, so I don't I didn't take it as an insult. But reading the dictionary, uh, I, I loved watching uh, Malcolm X, you know, and, and how he was reading the dictionary and learning multiple things, and reading the encyclopedia. My mom had the World Book Encyclopedia. So I would just open and read through pages and pages of things. I just thought it was the best thing in the world to do. Is every all the information you want to know, you can find it out. Um, and in doing that, I think that had made me what a brother called me. Uh, the brothers, I think he's outside now, has called me uh, dogmatic. He said I was rather dogmatic in that I am firm in the stances that I take. But I'm also flexible enough to acknowledge if I am incorrect. There's instances, obviously, when I'm sincere, but I'm sincerely wrong. So I want to make sure that I'm not rigid enough to not accept any other information. But because I have done research, I think that is also the reason why I'm so dogmatic. Because generally, the people that I'm speaking with have not researched anything. But they have a position on it, a firm position on it. So that's the reason why I speak the way I do and, uh, and towards someone who I think hadn't researched anything at all. But anyway, um, uh, <clears throat> so that's the reason I have written the books and booklets that I have is to give what I think is important to other people. And in doing so, I initially started off with one book and turned into four books and then into smaller booklets. And the reason they turned into booklets is because I found out people don't read, unfortunately. I mean, particularly about something that is the most important thing to read about. If you are a Christian, it would seem to me that you would read the Bible. If you are a Muslim, it would seem obvious to me that you would read the Quran. If you have any inkling about God, most of us believe in God, particularly in the community that we are in, in terms of African Americans. We have some belief in the higher power. I would say 90% or more. 
but they don't know much about God. They only know what they feel inside. They don't read any books. So I made the book smaller in order to at least attract them to read it. And one of the last books I wrote was a huge font. It's maybe 40 or 50 pages. It's kind of straight to the point. And all the books I write, I try to have a title that is provocative to at least interest them in reading because knowledge is so important. So on to these uh, stats that I just put down the percentages here, but I'll read down what read what these percentages mean. So I was looking on uh, a website entitled Literacy Project Foundation, and they had some very staggering statistics about literacy in America. And no, no, I know how I was on social media, and someone put something saying that most Americans read on a seventh grade level. And you know, this is the other thing, is that people now communicate through memes, right? Because they don't, the reason Instagram, I believe, is so popular now is because people don't want to write anything. And they would rather show you a picture, and show you memes and, and arguments. So I saw this meme, and generally, before I uh, uh, reproduce anything, I want to see whether it's true. So I looked on this website, Literacy Found, uh, Project, Project Foundation, found this to be true. I, I thought it was so outrageous that it was impossible that it could happen in America. Maybe they meant some other country. So they obviously did some research. In 2007, there was research done in California specifically. I don't know if it's because it's the largest state and it, it covers so much ground or the demographic there. But in 2007, they had this statistic. It said the research shows that 57% of students failed the California standard test in English. Now we know that there is some diverse cultures in California, so I don't know if that was uh, completely outrageous, but I thought that percentage was pretty high. It says uh, there are six million students in California system and 25% of those people, of those students are unable able to perform basic reading skills. It also says on this website, it goes into um, the nation, the United States of America in total, a study of literacy amongst 20 high High income countries, United States ranked 20, ranked 12th amongst in literacy. 12. I mean, uh, clearly our um, our what we value as important has changed, or is not, or someone else has sees it more important to be literate, or the community to be, to be more literate than America. And in America, it says illiteracy has become such a serious problem in our country that 44 million adults are now unable to read a simple story to their children. 50% of adults cannot read a book written on an eighth grade level. Outrageous, right, you're right? Yes, sir. And when they, you know, as I'm listening to you, when they mean read, they mean to understand and interpret, right? Uh, yes. Not necessarily be able to pronounce the words. Pronounce the words, yeah, to, to read and understand, absolutely. 45 million people are functionally illiterate reading below a fifth grade level. I'll read this, right? 44% of American adults do not read a book in a year. Six out of 10 households do not buy a single book in one year. I know they were talking about, one time they were talking about presidents and how many books they read throughout the year. Reading at least one single book, I mean, it seems like it's, the minimum that you can do in order to learn something, learn at least another perspective of someone else, even if you disagree with them. How are we learning more information if the only information we are gathering is from social media and from each other? How is it possible that knowledge can get in if we're not letting it in? Now they said this, obviously, I think we spoke about this earlier, correlates to the economy. Said there's a correlation between illiteracy and income at least in the individual income terms, in economic terms, and that literacy has payoffs and is a worthwhile investment. As the literacy rate doubles, so too, so too does the per capita income. So now it's talking about the economy on this website. Three out of four people on welfare can't read. Again, reading and understanding. 20% of Americans read below the level needed to earn a living wage. 50% of the unemployed people between 16 and 21 cannot read well enough to be considered fun functionally literate. 
Between 46 and 51% of American adults have an income well below the poverty level because of their inability to read. Illiteracy costs American taxpayers an estimated $2 billion each year. School dropouts cost the nation $240 billion in social services and lost tax revenue. Now, I want to make sure that this is clear because even people who are in, as informed as we are, we always gain, we always have a mental picture in our minds when we think of things, at least I do. As I said, when I think about Malcolm X initially, I think about Denzel Washington, and I remember that he is Denzel Washington. So in the same way, there's a mental picture put in our head because advertisement, because television is so powerful, it puts mental pictures in your head even when you know the truth. We know Jesus isn't white, right? If someone says Jesus, you may possibly think of that white guy and them with blonde hair and blue eyes. So in the same way, when we talk about welfare, we obviously, you know, there are dog whistles to other people mm -hmm. suggesting that when they're talking about welfare, they're talking about black people. But we both, we all know that the most people that are on welfare are white mm -hmm. Americans, right? They are the majority. So they would generally, they would, it would be uh, logical that they would be the predominant uh, people on it providing assistance, and they are overwhelmingly. Uh, so, and the same is true with unemployment. So, but our rates are higher, and that's an, that's another issue that we, that we can discuss. Uh, so, the impact of society on society: three out of five people in American prisons can't read. To determine how many prison beds will be needed in future years, some states actually base part of their projections on how well current elementary students are performing on reading tests. 85% of juvenile offenders have problems reading. Approximately 50% of Americans read so poorly that they are unable to perform simple tasks as reading prescriptions for uh, drug labels. Now all of these stats come from the National Institution of Literacy, National Center for Adult Literacy, the Literacy uh, company and U.S. Census Bureau. So this is what they say about literacy in America. Um, we are a nation of text messages, right? So we shorthand everything. Uh, we don't read books, uh, as been stated here. We don't even buy books. So it is natural that we are not the most literate nation. We are not the most progressive nation. We are not the most uh, knowledge-seeking nation. We feel we know it all, apparently, so much so that we don't have to read books. We don't have to read other people's perspective. Um, I saw this documentary on HBO, and I uh, saw it, I looked it up, and I saw it again this morning. It was talking about Little Rock Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I talked to um, Sister Anissa about, it, Anissa about it last week, because she's from Arkansas. And she went uh, to that school, too, uh -huh. I couldn't recall the actual title of it, so I looked it up today. And just as we were talking about the really in uh, these societies, or in, in general, when you see populations that are not literate and not reading well, a lot of it has to do with their socioeconomic position. And this, this school particularly demonstrated that in this documentary. So 50 years ago, the National Guard uh, had to be there in order for them to integrate their schools. And the late, some of the people that went to that school are still living today, so some of the people who were protesting it and saying uh, atrocious things are also living today, or their grandkids are living, or their kids are living, whom they taught this same belief system that, they, that black people are inferior, that black people should not go to the schools. I mean, they literally threatened them, threatened the people on camera. But at any rate, uh, she, one of the ladies who was a student there was so taken aback by how still uh, segregated this school is. Now this school has won several awards for its academic achievements. However, it also, it has a balance of uh, the white students are the ones doing, prog to, or doing predominantly well. The black community is doing poorly, right? And the, the total difference, the, the last the reason. Um, why do you think that, that the black African-American students uh, perform on such a lower level than the uh, white students? 
she said that they, some of them perform um, grade levels lower than the white students. And, the, and the, one of the black students said, because we have more responsibility. When we go home, we have to look after our brother. We have to cook for our sister because our mother isn't there because she's working two jobs and our father isn't there. So they're not only a student, they're a parent. They have work to do besides just going to school. Now also, the white students there live in a uh, well-to-do society, a well-to-do uh, community. Almost all of them drive to school, whereas the, the black kids are being bused to school, they walk to schools, and their neighborhoods look like the man, the one of, I think it was a councilman there, said it looked like a bomb dropped on in their neighborhood. That's how poorly they live. And also to demonstrate this, the president of the school, his name was Brandon, he was 17 years old. Now he's a, a black, young, young black guy. He's the president of the school, which means that the white students and black students together combined voted for him. He is also doing well uh, in terms of education, but he also lives in a predominantly well-to-do society. He drives to school as well. His parents are well-to-do. They also graduated from that school, so they wanted him to go to that school. So instead of him going to a different school where he lives, he drives his own car there. Uh, which would also demonstrate his socioeconomic position is the reason that he is doing well in school when other African Americans are not. And there's another student there who I thought was, it was very interesting. Her mother is a single mother. She has uh, two kids, a boy and a girl. Now the, the boy doesn't like school very much. He doesn't really like school at all. But the girl there loves school. And I thought, a lot of it had to do with the mother who I would always stress uh, education and she also had books all over the house. So she instilled education and knowledge and learning. So the daughter wants to be, I can't remember what profession she's seeking to be, but she has a picture in her home of like the sky, like reach to the sky, you know, and she loves education and she loves learning. Now, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, there's a small percentage of us who did relatively well for ourselves. We have a home, children, family, and all those things. But the large percent, percentage of those people, uh, the people from my neighborhood, are not doing that. Some of them are killed, some of them are in prison, some of them are on drugs. So I oftentimes have this argument with my friends. They say that if we did it, why can't everyone else do it? Now the answer to that is that we are the exception to the rule. We are not the actual rule. So you can't look at the exception and say, why doesn't everyone else do it? It would be almost like if someone is, if you're living in poverty and you're living where your, your parents are not as educated as they should be, and then you come up out of that and you gain education, you are an exception to the rule as, as opposed to someone who has well-to-do parents, who has a college education, who can help their kids in, in their homework and in their classwork. So we are an exception to the rule, not the rule. It will be the same as having one glass of water that is a cup that's clean and a cup that is dirty. The cup that is clean obviously will provide the best nutrients, but a dirty cup may provide you some nutrients here or there. You know, that's the exception. It's not the actual rule. But ultimately, the socioeconomic position is what is the predominant, uh, the predominant um, problem that we face. So as I said in the Quran, it's, it mentions over 700 times uh, the word elm or its derivative, which is an indicative of the importance of knowledge and seeking knowledge. And the Quran frequently tells its reader to research a certain topic or to ask those of knowledge about that topic. It places the reader into the role of an investigator. If you follow the advice of the Quran and research its contents, to verify its truth, you are bound to open yourself to more knowledge and more understanding. The Quran asked man to read. The first word that is given to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ikra, which means to read or proclaim. I think, I always think about that word meaning both things, is that you read and then you proclaim. You gain the knowledge and then you proclaim it. And reflect on, and it also asks man to reflect on what he has read and to talk with others about it. But this is how we should look at knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge. Now, in the Quran, it tells um, man to save himself and save his family. So ultimately, I think it's save yourself, you save your family, you save your community, and then you uh, look at the people at large. So in doing so, I wanted to 
talk particularly about the African American community and how we need to value education more. Uh, in this uh, documentary, there's a boy there who is in boxing. He um, is pretty, doing pretty well in boxing, but he can't read or write. He's not, I mean, the things that he holds important is boxing, something that will eventually fade or may never be of any, he may not be the best boxer or good enough to be boxing. But another thing that I think Allah has blessed me with was the understanding of what is important. Uh, when people were playing basketball and playing football, I'm not the best basketball player or football player. I wouldn't play well enough to get on the team. But I was reading books. I was learning because I know that my physical features, me being able to run fast and jump high, is not going to last for so long. But learning something, I will know it until I have dementia, until I can no longer remember. I can be 80, 90, 100 years old with the knowledge that, I'm that I attained from 12 on. So, that's another thing that I think Allah blessed me with the ability to discern what is important. And attaining knowledge obviously is. I had a friend of mine who was playing basketball for our high school. And he was also in AP classes. So he was all in all of the smart classes, but he didn't want anyone to know he was in the smart classes. He snuck in the classes. But he wanted everyone to know that he can score 30 points. He's not in the NBA right now, but he's a, a business person who's very, very knowledgeable. But it speaks to how we view knowledge and intelligence. Uh, if you play basketball really well and you're really smart, one of them is praised much more so than the other when it should be in the reverse. Um, <clears throat> so education is an institution that is built upon from generation to generation. What I know, I should impart to my son and to my other sons, and what they know, they impart to their sons, so it should be something that is a building block. So over and over again, we should be more knowledge knowledgeable. So the more that we, uh, we don't learn and we don't teach, the less knowledgeable we will become. And we are also given a 400, some, they have a 400 year head start on us. They held us back 400 years, you can't read. Now when you are able to read, you should be reading more, you should be reading all the time when we are not doing that. <clears throat> and, and we clearly should be. <clears throat> so, there was the father of Pan-Africanism, his name is uh, Edward W. Blyden, who was a Christian. And he talked extensively about Al-Islam in his book, uh, Islam, Christianity, and the Negro Race, I believe it's called. He did wonders for Al-Islam in terms of what he thought about Al-Islam and how it affected Africa in a positive light. He said, on the contrary, Christianity uh, exploited the, the, the continent. So obviously it would hold more merit to talk about what a non-Muslim had to say about Al-Islam, because you know I'm going to say it's the best thing since sliced bread. So he said, talking about education and the proclivity for learning, he said, indeed, throughout uh, Mohammedan Africa, education is compulsory. A man might now travel in every village he would find a school. Now clearly he said this is He's right in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He calls Al-Islam Mohammedanism. He calls Muslim Mohammedans. But ultimately, he's saying it was made compulsory. Muslims made it compulsory to learn. And schools are all throughout the villages. He also says, between Sierra Leone and Egypt, the Mohammedans are the only great intellectual, moral, and commercial powers. Now, those three things are extraordinarily important, particularly in our community, right? Great intellectually, learning, having knowledge. This is what the West Africans who accepted Al-Islam had. And this is what he's talking about. Great intellectually and moral and commercial. So also in owning business. So if you own a business and you are intellectual and you're moral, what other business can be as great as that? Now, I mentioned previously, I suggested previously that the African-American community accepting Al-Islam would immediately put them on a position higher than other people. Morally and intellectually, before they even gain any money, any wealth, because morally, we, we would be in more adherence to Al-Islam, and more adherence to God and the remembrance of God. And because Al-Islam is compulsory to learn, it is our birthright, as the brother said, for us to learn and to gain knowledge. So if most of America is thinking, is reading on a seventh grade level, and we read books all the time, we would be more intellectual than they. 
And if we pray all the time and we give zakat and we fast, we would be more moral than everyone else immediately without learning, without doing anything. And then we can get, and then we can move forward towards something more commercial and businesses and those things. But just the aspect of accepting Al-Islam immediately. Allah says this, not me. He says, we are the best of people for enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. So if they accept it immediately, they'll be raised to a certain standard higher than they are currently. And this, this plays out in, even in the slavery. The slaves who were Muslims thought themselves superior to the slave masters, right? Because first, I know the right religion. I'm, I'm a Muslim. You are a Christian and you not even practice Christianity right. You know what I mean? So they, they felt superior to them. So they never so came to the, well, it took years for them to break Al-Islam from them. And they, they could not do it with uh, the traditional form of converting someone. The, uh, because Al-Islam was so ingrained in them, it, was some, it wasn't something new. They couldn't just say, well, let me tell you about Jesus to a Muslim. Uh, we already know about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus, you know? So just the idea of having this knowledge and understanding will make sure that we won't succumb to certain uh, ills that other people succumb to. And again, having knowledge. Well, I'm going to um, quote again what, um, what Edward Blyden said. He said, Mohammedanism and learning to be Muslim, ne learning to the Muslim Negro was coevial. He said, no sooner was he converted than he was taught to read and the importance of knowledge was impressed upon him. <clears throat> now this is another reason why Muslims fought so vehemently again, as I'm saying, against slavery. The two no knowledgeable people that are exemplary of this is Nat Turner and Frederick Douglass, both of whom learned to read while being enslaved and they fought against their slavery, and ultimately uh, one of them lost their lives, the other one gained his freedom. Now this is the importance of knowledge, because if you have knowledge and you are reading and able to grasp and gain other information, you realize that your life is more important, is more demanding of you than just servitude to another person. Particularly if you understand Al-Islam, you realize that your servitude to Allah is far more important than servitude to a human being. <clears throat> and the spirit of Al-Islam and the Quran is critical thinking, research, and investigation to arrive at the truth. As we said, we are Muslims in that we are convinced of the truth. Uh, we understand it. It's not a blind faith, not a belief, as some connotations may have that we just blindly believe, but we are convinced of Al-Islam. And another uh, non-Muslim writes, Walter Rodney, in his book, How Europe uh, Underdeveloped Africa, he writes this. As in other parts of the world, literacy in Africa was connected with religion. So that in Islamic countries, it was in Quranic education. Muslim education was particularly extensive at the primary level. And it was also available at the secondary and universal level. In Egypt, there was Al-Azhar University. In Morocco, there was the University of Fez. And in Mali, the University of Timbuktu all testimony to the standard of education arrived in Africa before the colonial intrusion. And he's uh, here talking about Al-Islam and how it affected the African, that they were learning from the primary age, secondary age, and the universities uh, which are still standing today. And this is due to the potency of Al-Islam. We understand also the golden age in Al-Islam when we were uh, when Muslims were in the forefront of education, in the forefront of medicine, in the forefront of mathematics, and why Islam and, excuse me, Muslims have such a predominant role. We know, you know, algebra is an is a Arabic word. All of these things are learned uh, while we are in our goal.